Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel for a brand new Collider Ladies Night pre-party. This one needs no introduction. Everybody watching this video immediately knows how excited I am because right now I have Liana Liberato from Scream 6 on the show. I'm not going to say any spoilers about this movie yet. We'll get to it, but I will just say like the biggest congratulations in the world to you. I'm so excited for you right now. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited. I feel like I'm living in a dream, honestly. <laughs> and it's really fun to be able to talk about everything too, finally. Oh, we will get there. I can't even imagine walking around with so many secrets in your back pocket for so long and not being able to share them. But before we even touch screen, we like to go back to the beginning and every Collider Ladies Night begins with this question. What was the, the performance you saw, the movie you saw, personal experience you had, you name it, that first made you say to yourself, I absolutely have to be an actor? I would have to say it would be, I, I wanted to be an actor at a very young age. Um, I was uh, seven, I think, when I first asked my parents to be an actor. Um, and Julie Andrews was like a huge inspiration to me. I had done a lot of like local theater um, in my small town in Texas. And I was blown away by the fact that someone could sing and act and dance in a movie and I and I would watch The Sound of Music all the time and uh, Mary Poppins and all of these movies that Julie Andrews is just amazing in and I, she was definitely my my main inspiration as a kid and um, yeah she like I, I did I had no idea you could make a living off of that. <laughs> so you feel inspired at a really young age I know you were I know you were really young when you first started out, but do you remember at the time what you thought the first step to becoming an actor was? And now looking back, is that a first step you would actually recommend to another aspiring actor or did you find something that worked a little better along the way? I think, uh, you know, it's funny. I feel like a lot of people immediately go to school for acting. Um, they, I know, I've run into a lot of peers of mine who are are still acting and they um, they went to either a conservatory or um, like an acting college or something like that or um, did a lot of theater. And I think if I hadn't had parents who were weirdly like not very traditional, um, like Southern parents, like I feel like they never really encouraged me to play, like play life by the book and like check boxes. They they were like, you don't have to go to school. You, I, I mean, obviously normal school I had to go to, but you don't have to go to college. You can kind of pave your way in whatever way you see fit. And so um, I do feel it was kind of crazy that they were just so willing to give it a shot in Los Angeles. Um, I'm basically an only child. I have a half sister who um, was already married and um, taken care of out of the house and um, when I was born. And so my life was very much treated like an only child. And I think they just had a lot of, they had time to prioritize my dreams, which I feel really, really lucky to to have had. And um, they were just willing to kind of start a new life in LA and really dive headfirst. So I didn't really have to uh, wait until I was 18 and and move to a new state or go to college or anything like that. Um, I just got to kind of dive headfirst in, which I would suggest people do. It's really intimidating, but I think it's worth it. I do always love emphasizing the choice to or to not study in a formal program at school because that is very much the right path for some, but it's not for others. So for you personally, what is the way you like to be you know, taught or coached that melds well with how you kind of process and execute notes and suggestions you get? Uh, like not a formal school program. Is it learning on the job, on the go? Do you have an acting coach that you like to turn to for a particular reason? What is it? It really varies. I um, it depends on the job, um, and also you know I've always said like my job as an actor is to execute the product that my director wants, and so I very much look at it as a collaboration. Um, so you know if that means a lot of rehearsals, then let's do it. If that means sort of like flying by the seat of your pants and improvising and doing, you know, crazy things. Like, that's fine, too. I um, have tried uh, various different methods in my career, and I can't really say that 
I prefer one over the other. Um, I know that while we were filming Scream, we were, a lot of it was about just like a personal connection. Um, We all had a lot of time together. And I think that like really benefited the performance um, because there's like some serious material in there and there's like a lot of, um, you have to get like really dark and crazy and, and like, and I think that it really helped that we all felt very close. Um, and there was a little bit of rehearsal here and there too with myself and some of the other characters. Um, and, but yeah, I think that it, it really varies. It depends on the pro the project. You bring up Scream and I think that everyone could probably see my face light up. We have some other title. We have some other titles to get to, though. You have a couple of se- of exceptional ones on your filmography. Of all of the earliest professional sets that you were on, which would you say helped you put your goals into perspective the most in terms of the types of stories you would want to tell going forward and the types of onset experiences you would want to have? I would say um, one of my first more serious projects, which was a film that I did called Trust, um, which was directed by David Schwimmer, um, Catherine Keener and Clive Owen and Viola Davis are in the film. And I was 14 when I did the movie. I think I was 13 going on 14 when I was auditioning for the for the project. And I don't know why, but I was like, I think I'm just really ready to sink my teeth into something serious and like really test myself as an actor. And um, I knew the only way to do that was just to immerse myself in a really serious project and be around people that are veterans and, and can guide me in the right direction. And, um, and then trust came along and it was, it really like set a high bar for me as an actor. And it was also a, a huge learning experience for me because I had never played a role that demanded so much for me emotionally. And I don't think I really knew how to handle that or how to process it. And I remember um, they saved a lot of the more serious scenes for like one week of shooting. And um, I was shooting in a mall and I was sitting in a in a like booth and Catherine Keener came up to me and she was like are you okay <laughs> and I was like I don't really know <laughs> and she took a walk with me around the mall and kind of explained to me that this is what being an actor is is sort of cracking your heart open and feeling things that you're not used to feeling because you're putting yourself in such an emotional in such a in the place of you're putting yourself in the mind of someone that has gone through something that you haven't gone through and you do, you almost get like these phantom feelings because of it. And, um, she really helped guide me into like that, not feeling weird and the sense of like acceptance and like openness that, um, I really look for in jobs now. Um, and, yeah, I would say that was like the kickstart of the type of roles that I was looking for, the type of experiences I was looking for. I think like the greatest part of my job is that there really is no ceiling. Um, you 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 can constantly be challenged if you want to be. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of what I look for. And so, yeah, that's in jobs. Last point you made makes me think this has become one of my new favorite questions to ask. What would you say is your absolute favorite part of the acting process, whether it's rehearsing, seeing a set for the first time, really sinking your teeth into a difficult scene. But then I also want not necessarily your least favorite part of being an actor, but the part of the process where you identify the most room to grow for yourself and you're able to tap into that and explore. I think um, it's a, my my love for this job like constantly evolves like the reasons that I love it um, because you know sometimes you get a job that isn't as like creatively stimulating but the community that you're with is really stimulating and exciting and um, and then sometimes you get jobs that check both of those boxes and I think um, I think that's what I, what I love a lot is like learning and meeting people. I think my love from acting stems from my love of people and my curiosity with people. And so 
the more people that I get to meet and get to know and hear their stories and become friends with them, I um, that's like really nice and exciting for me. And getting to travel to places that I've never traveled before and work with really talented people feels like a dream come true. Um, and I think something that I've had to grapple with in my career is probably um, – I would say just the unpredictability of the job. I think that I've been doing this for like almost 20 years now. So I've seen like the ebbs and flows of this industry throughout my life and like just trying to remind myself how much I love it, even during times where I don't get to do it. Um, And also just like putting so much of your heart and soul into a project and then kind of having to give it away once you wrap and just hope that it sees the light of day. And sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it does. And um, it's and it really has no reflection sometimes on on your performance or or the people involved. It just, you know, this industry is so un- unpredictable sometimes and you kind of just have to. I, I like to do it because I like to act. And I like to tell stories. And at the end of the day, whether people see it or not, like at least that means I, I got to do something that I love. And I have to kind of remind myself of that every now and then. But that, that's what I would say is probably the hardest part. I, th- I think that's very, very reasonable. As, so- as someone who is uh, deeply passionate about her own craft slash job, the scariest things are those little lulls. And you know you're going to get through the lulls eventually, but it do- it doesn't it doesn't take away from like that darkness and fear that comes in with dipping into that sector (laughs) drives me nuts. Yeah. I, I think that that's just what comes with the territory of being a creative. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in like, if you wholeheartedly pursue the thing that you love so much, like it's, it's going to come back to you and, and it will serve you. And Um, but yeah, it can be really scary sometimes, but it's nice to know you're not alone. It's fun to talk to other creatives and be like, we've all gone through it. It feels like a rite of passage. (laughs) I mean, it really, it really is. Also, if you, if you don't have the fear of those lulls, it probably means that you're not, you're not passionate enough about what you're doing. And then maybe you shouldn't be here to begin with. So I feel like all, all of those, uh, those negative feelings are directly tied to a deep love and, uh, respect for what you do and that's important here yeah Yeah, all right let's Mm -hmm. desperately try to squeeze in another title or two before i go full force into scream this is one of my favorite ways to bring up uh additional films and shows of all of the actors you've ever worked with can you name one who has a process that's most similar to your own where the second you hit set you two were immediately in sync but then I want the opposite, someone with a completely different approach to the work that challenged you to adapt and maybe try something new for the better. Ooh, okay. Um, let me think. You know, I actually just wrapped a show with uh, Kaylee Cuoco, and I feel very um, connected to her. We, we play sisters in the show, so that could be a lot of it too, but... I feel um, we work very similarly um, where like our primary goal when coming on a set is like connecting with people and having a good time and laughing and enjoying life. And um, so I, we worked very well together because we were able to just laugh and be silly and then get to business. And then the moment it's, uh, you know, the camera cuts, you're kind of back to you know, enjoying people's company. And I think that I really love that way of working. Um, and I would say someone that, someone that I really admired working with, um, was Dermot Mulroney. Um, he is so fearless as an actor and I don't know. I mean, I know where it comes from, from him. Cause he's just so seasoned and so good. And he comes on set, he knows his place, Um, he's so prepared, but he has so much fun and he has this like fearlessness in his acting and he's open to trying new things and saying new things. He doesn't care like what's used, what isn't used. The amount of versions of his character I witnessed while filming with him was so cool. And he gave 
an abundance of 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 performances for Matt and Tyler to work with um, in the edit. So that was really cool. That was something that I was like, I'm going to take that with me. I need to I need to enter my sets just being overly prepared and like ready to throw out any idea that I have in my head and just being fearless about it. So that I thought was really cool. One of the greatest joys of the Scream 6 junket was just getting to feel the joy that Dermot Mulroney had about being part of this film and this franchise. It was infectious and it made me so damn happy. I know. He was so stoked and had he just came with so many fun ideas and like I just really admire him. He's just a cool person too. Oh, I would believe it. All right. You gave me the perfect segue. Let's do it. Let's get into Scream 6. I'm going to ask you one non-spoiler question just so so, some people who haven't seen the movie yet, you need to see the movie ASAP. But if you haven't, this is your one and only Scream 6 question. I want to know about working with Tyler and Matt because they are very special guys. What is something about the two of them as actors, directors, and leaders on set that makes them stand out from any other director you've worked with in the past? I would say their their ability to make you feel like time is like working for you. I which I, I think is one of the biggest like cruxes of this job is like you're always fighting against a clock. And it's it's a real talent to um convince your actors that you're not working against a clock and I felt like I had all the time in the world with them and they felt like, and they valued my opinion about my character and wanted to give me the time and space to execute those thoughts properly. And, um, and also for the fact that they're stepping into such a beloved franchise and I know they feel the pressure of that. And yet they are so collaborative. Like they, they don't act as if they're, being crushed by any type of expectation they want. They like trust you with the work they've given you and they want you to have input. It's just really nice. It makes me feel really valued as an actor. They make you feel very valued. I love hearing that. And it doesn't surprise me one bit. We're going to get into some specifics right now. So for everybody out there, this is it. This is your one and only Scream 6 spoiler warning. What happens now if you haven't seen the film is you push pause on this video, you go see the movie, and then you come right back and you push play and it starts here. It's that simple, but this is it. I'm, I'm literally about to blurt out one of the biggest spoilers of the film. I'm doing it in three, <laughs> two, one. You're a ghost face killer. Holy shit. That's huge. I know, it's crazy. (laughs) No, about every single step of this process. The the first thing that I was wondering was when you first started to audition for Scream 6, who did you think you were auditioning for? I didn't even know I was auditioning for Scream 6. I had no idea. (laughs) I didn't know anything. I I was about to go leave uh, the country to uh, go to a friend's wedding and I got a very short two-page audition for an untitled Paramount Spyglass movie and um, the character was very like sassy and funny and um, I was like okay I don't know what this is but sure let me let me tape it really quick before I leave and it was like the last tape that I did before leaving for like two weeks and I um, was in London a few weeks later And I got an email saying, hey, you have a meeting with Matt and Tyler um, for Scream 6. And I was like, when did I audition for Scream 6? (laughs) And and they were like, oh, the the audition you sent in. And I was like, oh, okay, great. And um, they gave me some additional sides, which was um, really exciting for me because it was sort of like a spliced up version of Richie and Amber's monologue in Five. And I, I was like, wait, does this mean that I'm the killer? What does this mean? And they're like, no, everybody's reading as this character, um, along with your, um, original sides. So, um, I was really nervous because I was out of the country and I had to reschedule. And I was like, that's the last thing you want to do is reschedule on like the Scream 6 crew. (laughs) And, um, luckily they were accommodating and, um, I, 
had so much fun um, preparing for. I'm so sorry. That was my mail coming through the door. Um, <laughs> it's scared me. It's all good. <laughs> um and I um I was so excited because I feel like um whether or not I was like the killer or not I was just excited to perform that scene because I feel like I don't get that opportunity a lot as someone who has like a very sweet face like I just don't look like a a mean person or like a an evil person and so I was like oh my gosh fun like I get to exercise this it, like it, it just would be it's just gonna be really cool and of course I wanted to I was a huge fan of Scream 5 I saw it in the theaters when it came out and I was like how do I do something different here like what like how can I play and make this unique and so that was really fun and um they were lovely they didn't have any notes for me they were like both of their little faces were like in the zoom screen they were like nodding <laughs> and they're like okay great and I was like all right and I hung up and I remember writing on my um sides I booked Scream 6 because I just felt it. I was like, I just feel like I have this job. And then I went through like one excruciating week of waiting and I got the job and I just sobbed <laughs> my eyes out. And um, and then I didn't get to know anything. I got like the first two acts of the movie and my character dies in it. And... I remember being like a little bummed because I was like, dang, like really if you're in a screen movie, all you want is to like be the killer, be the final girl or have like an epic, epic kill. You know, like those are, those are the like, those are the goals. And I was like, dang, I don't really get any of that. That's a bummer. But I was like, that doesn't matter. Like, I'm just so excited to be a part of it and be in it. And, um, and I didn't find out the truth behind Quinn until I was in my fitting and um, I had tried on all of my clothes and they were about to send me away. And then they brought Matt and Tyler in on zoom and they were like, Hey, we actually have one more outfit for you to try on. And they brought out the ghost face outfit. And I, I can't imagine what my face looked like. I was like, what? <laughs> like, what do you mean? I'm dead. They're like, yeah, you're not dead. Uh, surprise. And I got to try it on. It was so cool. And, it was funny though, because I still like didn't get any clarity really. They were just like, you're not dead. And I was like, okay, great. And then it was only until I arrived on set when I got to sit down with Matt and Tyler and be like, can you break this down for me? What's happening here? How do I die? What? Why do I want to kill everybody? Like what's happening? And, um, and then Matt and Tyler explained everything to me, which was so fun. And it was cool. It was, it was kind of strange because I was literally going into that scene with Jenna um, where I talk about like when my brother died, my dad went into the NYPD and I was like, I'm really glad I know this before going into the scene, like minutes away from filming it. But it was, it was like really exciting to just like be, be kind of thrown that curveball. And immediately we got to play with that. We got to do so many different like versions of that, of my lines and, and in that scene. And, um, and it was cool getting to see like what they chose from, from that. So, yeah. Oh, I have so many, I have so many follow-ups. The, the first thing that I was thinking about when your, when your mail came through though, was the scene in Scream, not to scare you, but like the scene in Scream 4 where she gets stabbed in the back of the head. Stabbed the in the, yep. Yep. My, yeah. My I feel mind. like a little spooked right now. My mind always goes to either a Scream death or a Final Destination death. <laughs> might not be like the hell. Oh my gosh. I have those. Hard. I have those thoughts all the time too. I mean, there's some really iconic deaths in all of those movies, so that makes sense. Okay, a million questions. First, you just brought up the the scene where you do the dialogue where you say, uh, you know, my my brother died and you talk about the car accident. When you do a moment like that, what is it like trying to calibrate the delivery so that it doesn't give anything away too soon, but it also ensures that when someone goes back and they rewatch it, they they could see and like hear or they could feel the seeds being planted earlier on. Yeah, I think that for me, I, you know, we did a lot of different colors of that. So, um, you know, some were more serious, some were a little bit more like, it's a, it's a fine line you have to walk because 
you don't want to play her too emotional about it because then you think there's something going on. But then you also don't want to play her super cold about her, her brother's death. So we did a few different variations. And then a lot of it is just like tr trusting Matt and Tyler to edit it the way that they felt translated best. And then also, you know, I, I did feel like I, I got lucky because I got to rely on the twist of me dying, of, you know, probably 15, 20 minutes later um, in the film. So um, even if people did suspect that scene and, and, you know, thought that Quinn was a little sketchy, which of course everybody will not trust anybody in that film. <laughs> and so I knew that there was going to be suspicion, but I did have, I did, I was able to rely a little bit on that, that lie that came later. Oh, absolutely. All right. I don't know how much you thought about backstory for Quinn, but I do have a whole bunch of questions that fall in that department. The, fir the first one I have is, what do you think life was like for Quinn growing up in this family? Would you like describe it as a quintessential upbringing where we're like things off from the very beginning that could hint that these characters would ultimately go down this path in life? Yeah, I think that, you know, we all kind of talked about it a little bit. And then also with the help of Dermot's like wild imagination, it was really fun that we got, we kind of did get to build that world a little bit. And, you know, I was trying to think just about Quinn's personal motive. And I kind of assumed I was probably the middle child, um, Richie being the oldest, um, me being the middle, and then um, Ethan being the youngest. And I think that I, I would like to think that like Quinn really looked up to Richie and um, was a bit of like a protector. And I didn't, it was a really big goal of mine to not come across too crazy <laughs> in the, in the reveal. Like I really wanted Quinn's anger to be, driven by an immense amount of pain and love for her brother and this this feeling of like i my my sole goal is to now protect my family and richie the way that richie took care of me and um so that was sort of like what i was i was trying to find a sense of humanness even because there isn't a lot when it comes to ghost face killers. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I think that we played a lot with, with, with those notes. And then obviously there being like a hierarchy in the family with like with Dermot. And he obviously has this immense amount of pride with Richie. One of my favorite lines that Dermot improvised is there's nothing like a father's love for his first son. And um, which makes me laugh every time because it cuts to Ethan and Ethan's like, Damn. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a good line. And so but that alone, like kind of lays a foundation of like the type of family or like the type of dynamic we were in um, as a family. So that was fun to play with, too. The humanness you just described comes through so especially strong when you say the line, you killed our brother. Like you feel every ounce mm. of that, of like, not just that rage, but the heartbreak that comes along with that reality. Oh, good. I'm glad that was, I, you know, it's such a big responsibility to play Ghostface. And I think a lot, you know, people have so many different expectations for that specific character and the motives and everything. And obviously you can't, you can't please everybody, but you, but I think that that for me is what was most important. It felt, it felt a little, you know, like Nancy Loomis was, she was a little like crazy, but she was driven by love. <laughs> and so I, I felt very similar to that as well with Richie. Okay. So you guys feel similar to Nancy Loomis. Quinn chooses Stu's mask though. Why is he her favorite ghost face? I mean, I think that just because he's so unhinged <laughs> and it could be like a little bit of a, a, a connection to even like to Dermot and to Richie and um, kind of how it's, I, it could just be like this weird Freudian thing of like, she likes these unhinged men. 
<laughs> and um, I mean, I personally just love the performance in of Stu. Like, it's just so raw and free and wild. And I think that Quinn probably just feels connected to that as well. I don't just think Matthew Lillard gives one of the best performances in the Scream franchise. I think his performance as Stu is one of the best performances in film history. And I I mean that wholeheartedly. I completely agree. It's, I mean, I didn't get to see the movie when it came out, but I remember, I mean, again, it goes back to this like sense of freedom as an actor to just like play and do these wild things. I mean, he's so unhinged that his tongue and like his eyes are just like, oh my God, what is possessing you right now? It's crazy. <laughs> it's so true. All right. So we have, we have Quinn, her brother, her dad, and her dead brother. What about their mother? Is she in the picture in your mind at all? <laughs> There was talk of mom um, that didn't make it in the film. Um, I think there was, there was a few lines of, of us. Well, not me, but um, Ethan sort of helping Bailey with the death of our mother because she didn't agree with things. (laughs) And that was cut (laughs) because that's, I mean, yeah, I was, that was something I, that one, that line always made me giggle while we were filming. Cause I was like, that's insane. I can't believe we all, we killed our mother. Um, and Dermot was so funny because he would, I'm like the only one who has red hair in the family. And so he would always say that Nicole Kidman was our mother. And he was like, oh, Nicole, so tall, so beautiful. Like, he just, like, riff off these crazy lines. Um, But, I mean, based off of the original script I read, mom is not in the picture. Mom did not make it to to the party. (laughs) What you just explained, though, will exist in my headcanon because this visual is just tickling me right now. (laughs) It's so funny. I actually would love to go back and ask, like, why did you guys cut that? It kind of makes sense, though. <laughs> I can put that in my back pocket and ask it another time, and now I probably will. What What do you yes. think Quinn would have done next if they had gotten away with it? Would it have gone back to, like, life as normal for her? Or do you think, you know, having a taste of uh, what it's like to be a killer would have continued her down a really dark path in life? Ooh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that... I would like to think that Quinn was like genuinely fueled by revenge and wanting to, um, you know, get back at Sam. Um, So I would say that maybe she'd try to get out of it. She'd try to start a new identity and be free of it after if she were to have avenged her brother's death um but also there you know there's this I mean as an actor of course my brain's like going all over the place I mean there's some craziness in her and um there's a a really impressive sense of drive in her as well so um who knows I'm she, she could be looking for the rest of her life for ways to avenge her family um so, yeah, I mean, th- I think it could go either way. I would I would believe all of that. All right, before <laughs> before we wind this down, I want to sneak in a question about one upcoming project cuz I am a very big fan of Justine Bateman's and I am still full-blown obsessed with her feature directorial debut Violet and just how wildly unique the style of that film is. I was curious with with the movie Face, it's the adaptation of her book. What can you tease about the style of that movie? Maybe it won't match Violet because Violet is kind of one of a kind, but something about her adaptation of her own book that stylistically in the end is going to make it feel different from any other movie we might have seen. Yeah, there are definitely notes of Violet in there for sure. Um, I love that film and I agree. It totally like pushes the envelope um, tonally. Um, And... I, you know, something that I love about Justine is she like isn't afraid to take risks or, or 
do things in like the not most like traditional way. Um, and yeah, face is great. I am really excited whenever the time comes to work with her. She, one is she's such a lovely person and I, I love working with directors who are willing to think outside the box. And I do think you're going to get notes of Violet for sure, but, um, there's so many vignettes and so many like relatable moments in in this script and also in the book um, that I'm excited for particularly women to watch because it's so relatable. And I feel like not a lot of, a lot of people in the industry talk about the immense amount of pressure women feel to just be themselves and, um, and not to like conform to society's idea of like how they should look or how they should act and, I'm really like honored to be a part of it. And I think that Justine is like the perfect person, obviously, to flush out this story. I think that people are going to be really impacted by it. I cannot wait. Before I say goodbye, I'll just name drop Totally Killer, Nanachka Khan. I'm very excited for that. And to send people back to other things, we can go to the stars great great film congratulations on that and mm -hmm. you know the first time we ever spoke many many years ago at this point was stuck in love <laughs> it, it was me you and nat and still to this day that is one of the highest viewed interviews on my personal youtube channel and i still every once in a while see comments pop up about that i won't rewatch it because i am mortified by my old work but everybody loves you guys oh my gosh were we in new york I think we, when we, we talked had been in New York. Yeah. I, 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 I remember I, that interview. I'm afraid, I'm afraid to click on any of my old work because it's, it's super embarrassing, but I'm really proud of how I've grown, but I don't know if it was done like in a junk, I think I might've been uh, like with a little, little like crappy camcorder. I think that's the phase we were in where you'd like plop a camcorder on a table and just like shoot the, shoot the folks from the movie wow. that way. It was uh long time ago. I agree with you. I always get I always get so nervous about looking at old footage of me, especially in interviews because I'm like I just don't I it I, I always get I think I definitely I well I know I suffer with like social anxiety and like just fear of saying anything or doing anything wrong. So going back and looking at things I'm like no, I can't do that. It's just going to perpetuate my own fears of myself. <laughs> so I um but that's so funny that we have talked before. That's so what an amazing full circle moment. I know, really. Um, and you know, people people still love it. Like we might have that that fear of looking at old work, but I can confirm that the commenters still love that interview and that movie quite a bit. Liana, huge congratulations that makes me happy. on everything you've accomplished on Scream Six, on everything coming your way in the future. It was an honor to have you on Collider Ladies Night. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy that I got to talk to you, seriously. It's so nice to like have in-depth, long conversations, long form conversations about things that we both love. So it's it, it lights me up as well. So thank you. Thank you.